Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians the 10th chapter. Thank you, I know the Bible says, um, Paul says in one place, he's talking about Timothy, and he, and he makes this great statement. He goes, I have none like Timothy. I think of my friend Big Doug. I think of the way he's faithful and serves the church. And I, I have none like Doug. <laughs> he is a godly man. He just, he, just, he just serves and loves the Lord. And if, and if you know him, he's just, he's just pretty even killed. And he's, trying to, he's trying to serve the Lord the best he can at all times. Can you say amen? amen? He's a man of God. I thank the Lord for him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm not seeming to want to turn things on this morning. <laughs> Check one. Am I on now? Maybe. Just a minute. Hold on. Oh, it's not me this time. Oh well. I can speak loud enough for all of us. I just don't know what the radio is going to hear next week. <laughs> Praise God. First Corinthians chapter 10, are you there? I don't know. I don't know what to say. Go to the handheld, we have to record it. Oh, handheld. Check one. I've done my inner event. I want to pre- Oh, I'll get happy up here with this. <laughs> Glory to God. Maybe something. I don't know. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What's the word before I say some crazy word? Am a dexterous sir. Somebody say it. You can do things both ways. Am a dexterous. Was that right? I've been known to say something that was not the right word. <laughs> Glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 10. Are you there? Glory to God. Somebody's going to get saved today. When I'm the, this is evangelistic stuff right here with the mic like this. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters as for some of them as it is written, the people sit down to eat and drink and rose up to play, neither uh, let us commit uh, fornication as some of them committed and failed in one day three and twenty thousand, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed uh, of the destroyer. And verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples or examples. Uh, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I want to talk to you just for the next few minutes on family ties. On family. We had such a good response to the Mother's Day message. Uh, we were talking about families and and, and, and honoring parents and, and, and the such that I thought I would go a little bit further today, uh, a little bit different different uh, flow, but yet uh, I believe it's the mind of the Lord. Here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, Paul says, Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant or, or, or unaware, okay? He's, he's reminding the church of its past, okay? Of, of Israel's past, their, their history, their heritage, okay? He's given a history lesson. We just read a history lesson in the Bible. You know, it's been said that the further you look back, the further you can see ahead. Amen? It's not the past we remember, but the past we forgot that ensnares us or enslaves us. I believe that history, uh, next to God's Word, is probably the richest foundation of wisdom and experience that we can draw from. We can learn from the past. We can learn from the past, good or bad, positively or negatively, we can learn. They say that history tends to repeat itself and that those who don't learn the mistakes of the past are subject to repeat those same mistakes in the future. Yeah. Now understand me this morning, church, we're not to hold on to the past. Okay? We're not to hold on to the past. We aren't to live in the past. We don't need to let the past dictate to our future. We don't need to let the past hinder us uh, from moving forward. 
The Bible tells us, Philippians 3, verse 13, to forget those things which are behind us and press onward to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. But in saying that, it doesn't say that we're not to learn from the past. Can you say amen? Yeah. You better. Otherwise, you may very well be repeating the same uh, mistakes uh, that were made before. Paul said right here in verse 1, I, I don't want you to be unaware of what happened to Israel in, in, in our past. And he goes on and say, he talks about how they were all under the cloud. They were all baptized through the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. In other words, they were all a part of what God was doing. Y'all with me? This is yes, I'm with you. They were all a part of what God was doing. Okay? But they didn't all keep their heart right. And he goes on to tell them, neither or neither be idolaters, or neither commit fornication, neither tempt Christ, neither murmur, because God wasn't pleased. Verse 5 says, with many of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, all of them at one time were a part of what God was doing. Nevertheless, they didn't all please God. And if you get all the way to verse 11, he tells us the very reason that this is recorded. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples. And they're written. Somebody say written. written. They're written for us. They've, they've been preserved for us for our admonition to learn from, in other words. That we might benefit from what happened to them. From looking at their experience, okay? Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul was saying, look, look church, we need to learn from what happened in our past. That's what he's telling them. How many believe that we today need to learn from what's happened in, in, in the past in this book right here? That's why these, these historical accounts have been preserved for us in the Bible. How many understand the Bible is history? True, accurate history. Matter of fact, it's been said before, it's His story. True history, okay? True accounts of true people. True events that, that really took place. Not just like an Aesop's fable, you know, a, a good example of something that you might learn. No, these are real events. Real people. Things that really happened. What? All of it. All of it. Just as real as 9-11. Most everybody here can remember 9-11. It wasn't all that long ago. I can tell you exactly where I was when that took place. <laughs> Just like maybe somebody older than me can tell me exactly where they were in World War II took place. Or, or some great event. Or World War I. Or Vietnam. Those, how many knows those things were real? Those things happened. Yeah. That part of our history. And it do us, it benefit us to learn from them. You know that the Bible, 267 times, you find the word remember or the word remembrance in the scriptures. God wants you to remember. He don't want you to. He wants you to learn. In other words, if we want a better understanding of, I don't know, of what's going on right now, right here today. What's today's date? Uh, May the 15th? May the 16th, 2021. If you want a better understanding about what's going on today, you can learn a lot by looking back. What do you mean? Well, I wonder why the Middle East has exploded this morning. Well, that's nothing new. They've been fighting over that teeny tiny piece of real estate for about the last, oh, I don't know, what, 4,000 years. Yeah, but the Israelites and the Palestinians and, and all this, this isn't some new 21st century conflict. This is just the latest version of an age-old conflict that the Bible tells us clearly about over and over. Well documented in the Word of God, as a matter of fact. Uh, and this is just the latest chapter of that same fight. Yeah. Now, likewise, if we want to better understand ourselves, how, how we may have arrived uh, where we are at in life today, you and I, our families, uh, well, we can learn a lot by looking back, okay? At our family backgrounds, at our heritage, your family's heritage, your family's histories. Our backgrounds, I mean, even in this room, our backgrounds are as, are as varied as our fingerprints. No two are identical. My wife and I come from two completely different backgrounds, two completely different upbringings. The only thing that our upbringings had in common is that they were both dysfunctional in their own way. And now somehow out of two dysfunctional upbringings or our heritages, we want to have a functional family. How does that work? I 
can tell you a little bit about her. Uh, you know, I've been married to her for over 30 years, and we've been together a lot longer than that. I, I know her history. She was raised fairly under fairly strict discipline. I didn't say godly discipline, but yet strict discipline. Kind of some of that my way or the highway type stuff. Isn't that right? Some of you know what that is. Whereas basically I was raised with no discipline. I could pretty much do anything I wanted to do. I mean, that, that there was a difference in how we were brought up. There's a Bible verse that says, uh, Proverbs 29, 15, a child left to himself will bring his mother shame. That verse could have been applied to my life if half the things I've done, I had been found out over. Both of our lives have been tremendously affected by the way we were raised. Let me say it this way. Both of our lives were tremendously affected by the choices that our parents made. Or maybe the choices our grandparents made. Everyone in this room today, everyone in here today, all of our lives to some degree have been impacted by choices that your parents made or your grandparents made. I was born in Florida, okay? But my father and mother got a divorce and my dad moved up to Alabama and that's how I ended up in Alabama where I met my wife. The mother of my children. Choices. My dad moved up to Alabama. And so that half the time, I was with him up here. That's how I got here. I think of the Pikes. I know a little bit about them. I know she was raised in Mississippi and he was raised in Mississippi, but yet their family was raised in Alabama. Why? Because some choices they made, some career moves and such like that. Choices affect people. They affect your family. Some of you in here may have been raised wealthy as a direct result of some of the choices your parents or your grandparents made. Maybe some in here were, were brought up you know, poor, perhaps because of some of the choices that your parents or your grandparents made. Those, th those aren't all the, the factors, of course. There can be other factors, but to some degree, your life has been impacted by the choices that your father or your father's father made. We tend to live our lives like, like our choices have no uh, direct, our actions have no direct influence on anybody else. That is not true. Friend, nobody lives life without affecting others. Nobody. There's nobody in here that's an island unto themselves. And as parents, we need to realize how our choices are affecting our children. Over in Exodus chapter 34, turn there if you would. Just an incredible, this is an incredible couple scriptures over in the book of Exodus. Here, Moses has asked God to show him his glory. And God says, you can't see my glory. You couldn't stand it. Nobody can. But he says this. He says, verse 19 of chapter 33, he says, I'll make my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. In other words, you can't see my glory. But he goes on to say, but I'll take you and I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. Somebody say Jesus. <laughs> I'll hide you. How many, we've been talking about being in Christ, haven't we? Being in Christ. He told Moses, you, <laughs> I have to put you in Jesus, otherwise you wouldn't be able to bear me. I'm so wonderful. I'm so glorious. But anyway, he goes, I'm going to pass by you uh, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to declare my name. Let me read. Uh, the Bible says, uh, verse 5 of Exodus 34, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now this is the Lord proclaiming His own name. Notice how the Lord describes Himself. <coughs> And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Do you know the first thing that the Lord describes himself as being is merciful and gracious? Literally in Hebrew, it's Yahweh, Yahweh God, abounding in loving kindness. That's literally a direct translation. Abounding in loving kindness. Hallelujah. Long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generations. Wow. 
So parents or grandparents that live their lives according to godly principles can generate blessings. Somebody say blessings. They can generate blessings that, that can flow through their family, through their family lines, uh, that can positively affect their descendants. On the other hand, parents or grandparents that have made choices opposed to godly principles, the consequence, the consequences of their actions affect not only their lives, but the generations that follow. Now I want to explain this a little bit. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book in 1963 where he quoted Al Sanders, and this is what, this, and, and they were making a contrast between one man of God and a contemporary. M Max Jukes, the atheist, lived a godless life. He married an ungodly girl, and from the union, there were 310 who died as paupers. 150 were criminals, 7 were murderers, 100 were drunkards, more than half of the women were prostitutes. His 540 descendants cost the state one and a quarter million dollars. This was during the 1700s, by the way. This is just those they could track. But praise the Lord, it works both ways. There is a record of a great American man of God, Jonathan Edwards, he lived at the same time as Max Jukes, but he married a godly girl. An investigation was made of 1,394 known descendants of Jonathan Edwards, of which 13 became college presidents, 65 college professors, 3 United States senators, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, 75 Army and Navy officers, 100 preachers and missionaries, 60 authors of prominence, 1 a Vice President of the United States, 80 became public officials in other capacities, 295 college graduates, among whom were governors of states and ministers to foreign countries. His descendants did not cost the state a single penny. And that was as of 1963. I mean, there's Proverbs 10, 7 says, the memory of the just is blessed. What a difference between great-grandparents that raised their family according to godly principles and those who did Your actions, your choices, they carry consequences, church. They, they don't just affect you, they affect your family. Say a, say a father gets sent to prison. Okay? The family is affected. They lose their father figure. Uh, perhaps they lose income, puts them in a, puts them in a poverty because there's nobody, there's not a, a, a father, a dad there providing income for the household. Uh, a, a wife loses her husband. Uh, a family loses financial support and may force them, like I said, may force them into poverty. These actions have the capacity of starting a downward trend in the children and in the children's children that maybe they don't break free of because one person. One father went to jail. I'm not saying this is the case for everybody. I'm just giving an example. Your actions, your choices carry consequences. I want to be real clear. It's the consequences. Somebody say consequences. It's the consequences of one's actions that can affect future generations. Not individual sin. Okay? Let me be real clear. It's the consequences, of perhaps, of that sin that can affect generations. Okay? But not the sin. Sin isn't passed down from generation to generation. If, you, if, just, if dad was a drunk, that doesn't mean you're automatically going to be a drunk. Now you can learn that behavior. And we'll talk about that. And then we're going to fix and talk about that. But that doesn't mean being a drunkard is in your DNA. Okay? God said in Ezekiel 18, uh, 4, He said, The soul who sins shall die. You're responsible for your own actions when it comes to sin. Okay, when it comes to those things. But let me be real clear. The effects of some parents' choices, they've touched their children's lives. There's consequences, okay? Your actions carry consequences. And the Bible te I mean, the Bible clearly teaches that all of us have suffered the consequence of the sin of our forefather Adam. We all have suffered from the consequences. Romans 5.12 says, By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so, de uh, so death has passed to all men. Every generation of man on this earth has had to deal with the consequence or the effect of Adam's sin. I mean, there's just one way to get cut off from that, though. 
That's by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can you say amen? amen? Romans 5 says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they uh, which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. In other words, you can do something about the consequences, the effect of that in your life. Can you say amen? That's a good place to say amen. Somebody say that, you know, as a born-again believer, I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. The handwriting of the ordinances that were against me have been canceled, Colossians teaches me. Those things don't have no power over me anymore. Praise God. I choose to follow Him. And any future generation, any future generational effects on my children, they're going to be the result of the blessing. Not, not, not of, 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 of a consequence of, of a choice I made uh, that, that is being replicated through my family line. It's going to be a result of the blessing on my family line. Because of godly choices I'm going to make. Godly choices my wife is going to make. That how we're going to raise our family. We're going to affect our generations, alright? But with the blessing. Can you say amen? Yes. With the blessing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, my children, every one of them, all four of them, they're grand, my grandchildren, they'll all be accountable for their own choices one day at some point. Like my older children are now, my grandbabies, one day they'll be accountable for their actions. But I'm stopping anything from coming down the line right here. Amen. <clears throat> no matter what may have happened before Tommy, it's not going through Tommy to the next. So many people, it seems, start life at a disadvantage, seemingly, I mean, from the get-go. And so often it's because of the choices that the parents made. Because of a heritage that doesn't reflect godly choices. You know, if I were to ask you this morning uh, to describe your heritage, how would you answer that? Now, I'm not talking about the physical building that you lived in and you were... That you, when you look back, you call home in your memories or the neighborhood, the state, the city, whether you were rich or poor. How would you describe your heritage, your, your family line? Uh, how would you do that? Now, in the past, I've used three words. I'm going to use them again today that I learned uh, from a, a lady, and they've always stuck with me. They were, that, that she described family past in three categories. The haunt, the house, and the home. And generally, you can, you, can, you can find yourself in one, or, or to be more honest, a mixture. A mixture of several of these things. But I want to describe a little bit, uh, uh, each one of these. Uh, you know, how would you describe your heritage? A haunt. A haunt is defined as a place habitually frequented by ghosts. Now this morning, I'm not talking, when I'm using this example, I'm not talking about spirits. I'm talking about things that haunt you. Okay? Things that have followed you. Do you come from a haunted house this morning? A haunted background where ghosts from your background are lurking still in your present? What ghosts from your background do you find lurking in your house right now? Like anger. Was mom always mad? Run house like a tyrant? Everything constantly in an uproar. Or was dad, or was dad you know, or was, or was dad, you know, iron fisted? What about shame? These are things that can haunt your house, say, man. These are things that, 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 that have plagued people in, 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 their, in, their, uh, in their heritage, in their background. What about shame? How many understand shame comes in all kinds of forms? Humiliation, disgrace, embarrassment. What about secrets? What about, oh, if anybody ever found out about that? What would they think? And what would happen? And this, that, or the other. What about fear? These are the kind of things that describe some people's upbringing. Fear. When you live in a house and you never know what might happen. Some of you know how. Some of you may know how it is for mom and dad to get in a fist fight. Praise God. Some of you may have never had to experience that. Some of you will never know how violent a fight can be in a home. I've seen a lot growing up along that line. Ultimately, ultimately, my mother lost her life because of that lifestyle. What about addictions? Again, I can, I can speak to my own. My family were prone to be addicts. Learned behavior. <clears throat> Remember my mama's mom. 
And, I, and, and everybody that I can think of in my, on my mom's side of the family had an addiction problem, including myself, you know. I remember my mom's mom, when I, she always had these, man, I don't know how to describe them other than like, you know, industrial size prescription bottles of pills. I mean, just, you know, like the size of this microphone. It's like, Valiums or Xanax or whatever it is they took. And she was taking them, and mom was taking them, and mom's brother, uncles were taking them, and all their friends, you know what I'm saying? They were all taking them, and they all got their own. Pers- I mean, it's just prone. I mean, golly, I didn't, that's been an addict button in my genetics, but it was sure something I watched and learned how to do. How to cope, how to deal with life. I watched one or two, maybe thinking I was going to be happy. Hey, get, get all tore up and be happy. You know what I'm saying? Get out your mind, have a good time. Forget that you know you don't have much or whatever it is. Get high and escape. I never forget I was watching a movie one time, and the killer was after these guys, and they were stoned. I don't know why I'm saying this, but it is funny. They were after this killer was after these guys, and they'd been smoking pot, and they were stoned, and, and everybody was freaking out. And the guy goes, "I know what to do." He said, "We'll get high and escape." I said, what? That's the kind of reason you come up with. But what about abuse? How many understand abuse can lurk in your home? In your, in, your, in your background and comes in all kinds of form, not just sexual. What about mental abuse? What about physical abuse? What about rejection? A haunt. I'm talking about ghosts of, of rejection that you just never were good enough. You never could you never were good enough. No matter what. You never could do anything right. Or, or even depression. Even depression. Your memory's haunted by that ghost of depression. Depression, I always define depression as anger turned inward. You know, you could be you could be you could be depressed, not angry at anybody outwardly, but hate yourself. Mad at yourself. For various those those issues, those type of things that they, they wreak havoc in childhoods, okay? Maybe maybe you were raised in a haunt and you swore, when I get older, I'll never have that kind of stuff going on. I'll not be like that. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, you look around and you see some of these those same things happening in your own family, in your own household. I'm not talking about curses. I'm talking about <laughs> learned traits, learned behavior, trying to haunt your house, ghosts from the past, trying to trying to trying to affect you and affect your children. You know, the Bible says when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your life is cleansed, forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5:17, if any man be in Christ. He's a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. All things are new. But what scars are you still toting around? What scars are you still toting around because of uh, your family's destructive habits and, 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 and things that you learned because that's all you knew? The Bible tells us we have an enemy who's going about seeking inroads into our life like a lion, looking for somebody to devour. Looking for someone where he can carry out his destructive uh, stealing, killing purposes. Looking for inroads into your life. Those inroads, I like to call uh, those inroads, the Bible I believe refers to them as iniquities. Iniquities are weaknesses and tendencies that run in a family, not from genetics, but from learned behavior. Okay? Maybe you get unreasonably angry like mom did over nothing. Or maybe you procrastinate over everything like dad. You never finish anything. Maybe divorce. Maybe everybody, everybody seemingly in your family has been through a divorce. Maybe, maybe people are bitter. Maybe dad was bitter because grandpa was bitter. I mean, goes, the list can go on and on. These things aren't genetically passed down, okay? They're learned. Perhaps you swore, not in my, I will never be like that. But yet, you find yourself mad. You find yourself bitter. I'm telling you, you can be set free from those things today. Can you say amen? amen? Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many understand the blood of Jesus set you free today? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there's a remedy. His name is Jesus. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Healed. Set free. Amen. 
You might say, Pastor, that, that's pretty extreme. Well, maybe your story isn't that extreme. Maybe you never experienced what we're referring to as a, a haunt today. Maybe, maybe you just grew up in what we'll call grew up in what, grew, uh, what we'll call the house. Just a house. A house is defined as a living quarters for a family. Just a house, four walls and a roof. Not much love there, not unconditional love, but, but yet there was a roof there, there was provision there, but yet it was still a place where selfishness, pride ruled, where undefined authority perhaps, rebellion, independence was always up for grabs. Moms and dads' word wasn't the rule. Maybe a lack of communication, nobody really knew each other. I mean, I understand you can live in the same house with people and not really know them. You can, in church. Emotional isolation, where people you can be you can be here today in this room full of people, but yet be alone. Right here today, right now, feel all alone, like nobody knows, nobody cares. Surrounded by people, but yet alone. Always on the defense. Everything always your fault. What about a, the characteristic of every, every, everyone's always being indifferent? To you or your needs. Feel like nobody's ever listening to you. Be quiet, I'm watching TV. Leave me alone, I'm busy. Whatever. No common purpose for the family. Everyone just existing to death, uh, together. Uh, I think of King David. Yeah, I'm talking about David. King David. I like David. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But let me tell you something. David had issues as a father. I said he loved the Lord, but as a father, he had issues. What a warning for godly parents. He provided a, a, a house for all his kids, but it, I wouldn't call it a home. He had a dwelling place. There was a roof over their head, okay? But it, I don't know that you'd call it a home. It was his, his children were right to each their own. Everyone looking out for themselves. What a warning. What a warning for parents to be involved, to invest in their children. Uh, some of the issues that affected David's kids were... Learn traits that were passed down from David to his children directly. David couldn't control himself when it came to women. Neither could Ammon, his son. Neither could Solomon, his other son. One raped his sister, the other had 600 some wives. But you know what? Some of the problems that David's children had... They weren't, they weren't learned behaviors. They came as a result of living in a house rather than a home. The rebellion of Absalom? Well, David never sowed rebellion. When Absalom, when Adonijah wanted to be king, set himself up as king? Well, David never did that. The Bible said he always humbled himself. He wouldn't raise his hand against Saul. But yet here's his own children because they was raised in a house of indifference where everybody just do what you want to do. They both, two of his sons rebelled against him and set themselves up as king. They didn't learn that from him. That was a result of their environment, of the way they were raised. When your house is not a home where there's no defined authority, where there's no consequences for your actions. All his sons were competing for his throne. Those, those traits were developed in an in a, in a atmosphere of indifference. Where maybe dog eat dog or survival of the fittest. Now, now watch this. David, King David, their father, provided for all of them food, shelter, clothing, even a name. They had a name. They were somebody. But those things don't make a home, friend. Government can put food on the table. Government can put you in a house. Government can keep your lights on. But government can't nurture you. Government can't raise you up in the ways of the Lord. Y'all listening today? Government can't raise you up in the Lord. Government's not passing on any values I want my children to be uh, receiving. Where there's no unity, no, no common bonds binding them together. Today in society, we've got a lot of hard-hearted young people. We've got a lot more house people who are raised in houses rather than homes. Fathers that are represented by their child support check and not represented by their presence ever. Mothers raising kids because they're stuck with them, not because they love them. Still worried about their career and not the raising of each. Friend, when you decide to have children, I told my wife, when we decide to have our children, we, we acknowledge, well, our career's over in one sense. We've got a new direction now. Hmm. 
raising kid out of kids out of obligation rather than desire, not raising them at all, leaving them to themselves. No wonder there's such a hard, unloving, non-compassionate generation being raised up. They don't know anything different. What if the church stepped out and started loving on people unconditionally with the love of God? Uh, hallelujah. The compassion of Jesus touching the world. Glory to God. See, I can, I, can, I can talk a little bit about a haunt and I can talk a little bit about a house because that's kind of in a mixture of the two. There was things, there was things that, that there were ghosts from, from the past that were trying to destroy. But 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 you know, and there but there's there was a roof. There was I wasn't on the streets. So a lot of us understand haunts and a lot of us understand houses. We've been there and done that. I want to address the home for just a couple minutes. Because I wasn't raised in the home, but I've determined I'm going to provide one for my children. Regardless of your background, you can control your future. Somebody say amen. amen. Now some of you were raised in homes. You understand what a home is. Where a family lives together and they're bonded and they're, everybody's apart. And they're submitted to godly authority. Proverbs 3.33 says, God blesses the home of the righteous. Where there's loving relationships between mom and dad and brothers and sisters. And, and there's unity and they love the Lord and they love each other. And there's vision and there's thankfulness and there's discipline and there's order. And there's accountability for one's actions. Not everyone just doing whatever's right in their own eyes. And there's forgiveness when you blow it. And there's love and there's, and there's peace. You know, a lot of people, a lot of kids, they don't know anything about peace. Because everything's always been. My children will know peace. Isaiah 54, 13 says, And all the children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. You know, there's an expression that says, Home is where the heart is. That's right. Dad's heart, mom's heart, God's heart, the kid's heart, everybody's heart. How many understand the first institute, uh, institution of worship was the home, the family? Glory to God. The Bible says, Proverbs 27, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. I can tell you this, if blessings haven't been a part of my family's past, they sure are a part of our future. You can say amen? I'm talking about blessing. I'm talking about divine favor. Glory to God. Where everything that you put your hand to is blessed. Where the fruit of the, your womb, the, the work of your hands. Deuteronomy uh, 28, 2 says, All these blessings shall come upon thee and will overtake thee if thou will hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Amen. I like what Hebrews 11 says. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Friends, today perhaps you're being warned about some things that could come down, down the pipe towards your house, towards your home, towards your family. Noah was warned about things not seen, and God gave him a design to escape. How many believe that God's given us a design to escape? It's this Word of God right here. He's given us a design that will help us escape. Noah, Noah did everything. Listen to me, church. Noah did everything he could to help his children escape the, the impeding judgment on the earth. But he couldn't drag them into the ark. They had to make that choice for themselves. You can't save your families, friend, this morning. Only God can save. But we can build homes. Come on, parents. We can build homes that's always pointing them to Jesus. Pointing them to the one who can save. Pointing them to the answer. Y'all with me today? Your kids will make their own choices. But we must point them in the right way. Because one day... I've had two children already leave my home. I have two more that one day they're going to be gone also. One day they're going to set up their own homes. Randy has and Priscilla has and I don't know how, but one day Wyatt will and Eli will. <laughs> one day I expect them to declare, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I'm talking about Amen. Eli's home and Wyatt's home, like Priscilla's home and, and Amanda's home. How's that going to happen? It's going to start. It's going to start in my home. We're going to need to solve God. We're going to be examples of Christ's likeness. 
We're going to encourage faithfulness. Glory to God. Amen. Why would you encourage faithfulness? Because that's what God rewards. Faithfulness. I'm going to educate my children like I have been doing and going to continue to do in the ways of God. In the home. Just like we said last week, if, you fa if your religion don't work at home, it just it really don't work. We're going to establish godly values in the home. Why? So that my family and my children and my children's children, children will experience all that God has intended for them. Glory to God. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for His arrival, church. I am. I'm waiting on the return of the Lord. But in the meantime, I've got children. And I've got grandkids. I plan on having bunches more. And I want them all to be blessed. I want them all to serve in the Lord. I want, all, I want them all to walk in favor. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Because family matters. I said family matters. Amen. It matters. Now maybe this morning there was some things that you heard, that some things that were described, and maybe it touched a spot in your own heart. Maybe, maybe, maybe your background wasn't all that it could have been. I said maybe you, maybe you were raised in a home that has affected you. I, I can tell you the truth. You were. You were raised in a home that has affected the way you are today. All of us. Whether positively or negatively. Maybe today the Holy Ghost touched something in your heart and reminded you of something or revealed something to you or exposed something to you. Well, today is a good day to let the Lord deal with that. Let the Lord minister to you. Today, if you're still carrying those scars of a, of a past that, 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 are, that are hurtful, God wants to touch you. I said God wants to touch you. Glory to God. Maybe, maybe you've had a wonderful upbringing. Your parents... They should be on the cover of TV Guide. They were or on the Bible, maybe a better place, because they were so good. But you don't seem to quite feel like you're living up to that standard yourself. God wants to touch you. God wants to touch you. We started this off this morning about talking about the past, not being stuck in the past, but learning from it and moving forward. Amen. It's my prayer today, as I was praying and preparing uh, this week, that, that hearts would be receptive to the Holy Spirit today. That today, if God spoke to you about something or, or stirred something up in you, or, that you would let the Lord continue that work. You would let the Word, the Lord touch you. You would let the Word run its course in your heart today. That you wouldn't harden your heart. That you wouldn't just, you wouldn't just say, yeah, I know what He's talking about and leave and walk right back in that same old situation you've been in for the past 20 years, that you'd allow the Word to affect change in your life. Start right here right now. I said start right here right now. Today, if you're here and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. I said you need Jesus. Don't leave without accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'll pray with you. I'll show you the, 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 same, the, the same path that, that everyone who's ever accepted Jesus took. They asked Him into their heart. They asked for His forgiveness. They forgive Him of their sins. That He'd be the Lord of my life. And it was that simple. But now we understand you can be born again in here today and still hurting. Still hurting because of things that have affected you in your past. Or still hurting today because you see some things going on in your children that, that you don't want going on with your children. And you can see where you may, you, you may be on that path. But praise be to God. God's always on time. Amen. He's always on time. Glory to God. You can turn, you can turn from that path today. Amen. You can turn from that path. You can, you can be that, that, the godly mother, the godly father that God created you to be. You can do that. Amen. All you got to do is ask the one, amen, who's ever made. If, if, there's, if there's ever been a godly mother, it's because he made them godly. They chose him. If there's ever been a, a godly father, it's because he, he made them godly. They, they, they chose him, amen. The Bible says that, that God gave 
Noah, uh, excuse me, Noah, yeah. Noah, the design for an ark for the saving of his house. God's got a design for your family. He's got a plan for your family, for the saving of your family. Amen? Say amen. Y'all stand up with me. If I can pray with you today, I'm going to pray with you. If today you're here and God spoke to your heart, don't harden your heart, but respond to the Lord. God wouldn't, God's not a wasteful God. If God's speaking to you, that's because He's wanting to do something in your life. Amen? I can, I, can, I can make it no clearer than that. If God has touched an area of your life, if He's speaking, if He stirred 